on. And so um, this is a, we've got a great group joining us um, and I think it's gonna be a fairly full house. And so I encourage you to use the chat, um, go into the chat and introduce yourself. Let us know where you're dialing in from. Um, I, I believe there's gonna be people from all around the world. Um, take a look also at the house rules. Um, we are gonna be trying to, through this conversation, answer all the questions that are asked. Um, and we'll either do that through the Q&A, and we have a number of people presenting today and some of the team supporting that are gonna be trying to answer those questions. And so um, it's really important to get those questions in. We will try and answer some live as we go through and look at some of the solutions that are emerging um, and have conversation around that. Um, at the same time, please amplify this on social media. Um, it's really important that we grow the uh, community that is engaging in the conversation around the Food Systems Summit. Um, and so please use the hashtag UN Food Systems Summit 2021. So quick introduction, my name's Paul Newnham and I'm gonna be moderating today for you. And so as we get into things, we've got uh, 90 minutes planned where we're hoping to really um, expose you to some of the working uh, groups and the work that's been happening um, around uh, this action track um, around sustainable consumption. And to get started, what we've done is we've actually inviting a chef, Chef Gayatri, who's a chef educator from India, a member of a group that we partner with called the Chef's Manifesto. And she's gonna um, just help us as we start action track two conversations to really go on a journey to an organic natural farm um, in India and to show you where sustainable food options um, come from before uh, reaching your kitchen and your dining table. And so Chef Gayatri um, wanted to be here live. She's traveling at the moment. And so what we've done is we've got a, a short video that she sent um, that, she, that ties in this visit and we're gonna put that up on screen and show it. If there's any delay in the video, we're gonna run with it. Um, we also are going to drop the link to the video so that you can have a look at it yourself later. But um, sometimes the bandwidth issues, you, 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 even the best laid plans have some um, challenge. So uh, let's, let's run the video from Chef Gayatri. I'm Gayatri Pishoria and I'm Chef Educator in Amritsar. I own Gayatri's Gourmet, which is a food education company that empowers school children to make wise food choices. The following video is from a recent trip to a local farm in Amritsar that shows local sustainable biodiverse ingredients. Check out the video. Hello Chef's Manifesto, I'm Gayatri Pishoria and I'm reporting to you all the way from Amritsar in Punjab in India. I am in a local zero budget organic natural farm and I'm going to show you what we're growing here and how we use the produce. I have some lovely carrots, I have some turmeric, I have some uh, turnips, I have potatoes, spinach and whatnot. Follow me into the farm and let's see how we can cook with it. So if you can just look down at the field, the field has a lot of mulch in it. So what's mulch? Mulch is not just leftover leaves from the entire field. It's also jute bags, carton bags. So if you can see the beautiful yellow hues of the haldi, it looks like ginger really, but when, once you wash it and you smell it, it is epic. If you take the camera up above, you will see poplar trees. Trees have shed and all the leaves, the poplar leaves have come into the field. That helps add additional nitrogen, natural additional nitrogen to the field and also helps the growth of friendly pests. So right now in the shalgam field and shalgam are turnips okay so over here we have uh, anar which is pomegranate shalgam we have muli muli which is radishes and we have green apples growing all in the same field of course you see the groove here as well which helps retain water in the upper section of the field um, and drains the excess out of the lower section keeps it moist for longer so that we don't use uh, too much water okay so let me just try to get some shalgam out and here is, ouch, I broke it, but here's a radish. We like to use the whole vegetable. Uh, what would famously be made in Punjabi houses is muli ki sabzi, which would use the, um, the vegetable and um, the leaves tossed together and spices. 
Okay, so I'm in the field which is just being cleaned up uh, and you know they're adding some manure and they're going to be running a tractor through it. What I really want to show you are the birds right behind me. These are in Punjabi they're known as baglas uh, but um, they're, they're, to me I think they're a variety of crane. So they're pecking into the soil and they're looking for food and what they're eating uh, are these particular pests that we don't need in the soil. So they're literally helping us clean the field. It's amazing how nature supports mankind. I just want to talk to you about carrots. These are, these are seasonal uh, crops. Um, what we really have been doing since time immemorial is um, actually use uh, carrot leaves as fodder for animals. Also, something very interesting I want to talk to you about are the weeds that grow uh, within the carrots. So these are like wild weeds, we're not really sowing any of this. Um, so these are weeds that are not removed by the farmers because they help preserve the nitrogen content of the soil, thus preserving land health. Potato leaves, not very edible, but they're used uh, for mulching right in the field. So if they're a waste from the crop, the farmer pops them back into the field to help restore moisture and nitrogen. So this is the garlic field, lasun in Punjabi, garlic in English. If I can just try to get a bulb out. Okay, yeah, so they are still babies. Um, but what we would do is actually use the entire bulb of garlic and use uh, the leaves as well. So they have a lot of flavor. You can use them as garnishes, you can use them in soups and stocks. Very, very flavorsome. Okay, so now I'm in another field in the same farm and what we have here is gobi, which is cauliflower. So what we like to do with cauliflower is actually use the whole floret and we use the dandhal, the this, this stalk of it is called dandhal in Punjabi and we use it for stalks. Uh, we also puree it and we make uh, like a little mash out of it. The leaves as well are used in our parathas. Okay, so now it's time to get some palak. Palak is spinach in Punjabi and I'm going to show you some of its beautiful, beautiful fragrant leaves so I mean I would actually use them just the way they are in a salad or make a little wrap out of them so now I'm in the gaushala the gaushala is the cow shed um, and I'm with the calves so these are only these are like really really young babies uh, the farm literally depends on the cow shed um, the cow is an immensely important animal at the farm uh, you know they use cow dung to irrigate the fields they use cow urine so it's a beautiful symbiotic relationship Hi, so I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, as a chef, I constantly like to educate myself about the farm and also the children who study with me. We actually volunteer at local farms, help local farmers, help also raise funds for them. Uh, it's immensely important and sustainable that chefs and students uh, and everybody, the community at large, actually involves themselves with farmers uh, and understands sustainability, biodiverse ingredients and understand, understands how to eat local till as far as is possible. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the video. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Chef Gayatri. It's just really great. Um, often I know I'm involved in lots of conversations about food and it's really important to really go back to where our food is grown and how it's grown and how the connections happen um, to create sustainable food for people and planet, to see how ecosystems work together and so I really want to do a big shout out to Chef Gayatri um, to just say thank you for uh, taking us on uh, a little field trip as we uh, launch this conversation today, looking at Action Track 2 and some of the, the solutions that are emerging. So in Action Track 2, there's three working groups. And today we're going to be hearing from um, people that are leading and involved in each of those working groups. They're going to be pitching some solutions that are emerging. And then we're going to be having some debate um, and some opportunity for you to ask questions using uh, the question function um, that can be answered and responded to. This is really important because this process of developing solutions uh, as part of the summit involves everyone. And so at the moment, we want to thank people that have already shared ideas and solutions. We've received over 350 ideas and these ideas are, are being assessed against three criteria around impact, actionability, sustainability and they're all going to be shared and posted in the UN Food System Summit community platform and if you haven't gone there the community platform is a, is a, is a, a space for everyone to go in and be able to have a conversation to be able to have a say and to be able to interact together. You can set up your own account and then you can interact with the different work streams, you can interact with the different communities and networks and ask your questions and then also respond to one another. 
And so this is one format that um, this, 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 this conversation today where you can engage, but that's another one which you can engage in. And so I encourage you to go there. So the ideas will all be put there. It is not over yet. So we also have the chance to, to get more ideas submitted. And so if you wanna use the online form, it's still open for another six days to February 9th. And it's gonna be in the chat now go into that form and still add those game-changing ideas that you may have. I see some people dropping ideas. People have been having food system summit dialogues and sharing the, the learnings. If there's things that are emerging from those processes, please go in to um, the, the, the survey now there and, and, and add those ideas. Give us uh, those ideas because they're all important. And it's, it's how these ideas come together and how they're assessed are really critical for us to really um, understand the best way forward. So the solutions are gonna be um, evaluated based on those three key criteria and they're gonna be integrated by the action track team in, in a short list of solutions, which will be public and shared uh, by mid February. And so all of the ideas uh, will be looked at and worked through um, on those three criteria about impact, actionability and sustainability. So. Um, we'll be sharing them and then having more opportunity for, for conversation. So we're now going to, um, I can see some really great um, feedback in the, in the chat already. We've got people from all around the world. I think most continents I've seen covered. Um, great to see um, people jumping in there, explaining where they're coming from, what they're working on. Um, this is really, really key to, to build connection. Um, and I can see that the, the questions are starting to fire up as well. And so please make sure you're going into that Q&A function down there to really get on and answer um, those questions. So now the next part, um, as I mentioned, is we're gonna go to the different work streams. And the way this is gonna work is we're gonna have uh, two members of each of the work streams um, introduce a solution. And so they're gonna give us their view of, the, of a solution for their work stream. And then following their presentation, and it's gonna be short, it's gonna move fast. We're then gonna have a, a bit of a debate. And so it's gonna be in classic debate you know, format. We're gonna have two, two minute remarks and we're gonna have two people come back and they're gonna give some remarks to kind of challenge this um, uh, solution. And then there'll be a chance for the people that presented it to respond to those questions. And then there'll be a chance for you to ask questions. And we'll have probably time for three questions on each of these. So get in quick. Um, and put those questions in there. Think about what you're going to ask. So to start off with, we're going to start with Workstream One, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to invite uh, Pramisha and Yi um, to join us. And so they're going to turn their videos on. Uh, Pramisha is an advocate for climate justice and sustainable food systems, and a member, a youth member of the Workstream One on food environment. Yi is uh, the president of Good Food Fund China and the lead for Workstream One on food environment. So over to you guys to um, present your solution. Thank you, Paul. Happy to speak on behalf of Workstream One on food environments. Uh, food environment solutions serve as enablers, making it easier for consumers to access foods that contribute to healthy, safe, and sustainable diets by ensuring that such foods are available and affordable. Uh, in the past few weeks, ideas are coming in from across the globe. My Workstream One colleague, Pramisha, will be presenting one idea generated by Patrick Webb, a nutrition researcher and Workstream One colleague of ours. Pramisha, please. Uh, thanks, Jian and Paul. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in our public forum today. Uh, one of the solutions that we have been focusing on is harnessing power of public procurement and linking farmers with consumers via institutional meals. Uh, these days, uh, we can easily see the increasing dependence to junk food and fast food chains, especially in the case of children and youth. Uh, last year, I used to teach in a public school in Nepal, and it was really good to see that students up to grade five from all backgrounds are getting a chance to eat healthy lunch cooked at school. Uh, the majority of food there was bought with local farmers rather than market itself. And 
not only in Nepal, a large number of people around the world eat their food at their institutional settings. For example, school meals, hospital meals, prisons, orphanages, government canteens, and many more. What if universities replace their fast food chains with healthy and nutritious dining options? There will be many questions and such institutions pose its huge potential to use their power for public good by promoting healthy and nutritious diets as well. Uh, this is an existing solution currently, but it would do great if we could multiply it all across the world in different institutional settings. Uh, thus investing the budget for healthy and nutritious meals not only in meals, but also through advertisement channels in dining halls could be a simple but effective solution to change the consumer behavior while improving nutrition. For instance, during dining, if we could send the message of importance of healthy food through TV at dining hall, posters in walls, or even print at players, the school children would go home and tell about this to their parents and consequently to have ripple effect. And uh, in my view, it would even be cost effective and value on the part of the producer if the institution directly transacts with farmers, uh, local farmers especially. And uh, yeah, these solutions need institutional expansion and budgetary investment and could be supported by government, advocacy groups, NGOs, and UN agencies like Old Food Program and FEO. Uh, this is a simple yet highly effective solution uh, from our in opinion of our work stream one in terms of changing the food environment, especially the dining environment in institutional settings and changing the consumer's perception. Yeah, this is one of the many ideas that our work stream is considering up to now. And we're also trying to explore solutions like imposing sustainability levels and food like traffic lights in the road and similarly amplifying sustainable food chains over current fast food chains and many others. Uh, the solutions right now are not perfect, but we need deviates like this currently and discussions to fill the loopholes and make them the perfect one. Uh, thank you very much and over to you, E. Yeah, thank you, Pramisha. Uh, the, the, uh, right now, the uh, solutions that we have received so far, uh, many of them are related to uh, schools, uh, school meals, and education. And we noticed that these solutions are actually coming from all over the world. So that actually proves that this is an issue that actually concerns uh, almost all the countries and uh, uh, a very, very important issue to address. Uh, so we hope that uh, this example that we are giving today could give you uh, some uh, glimpse of what kind of solutions we are trying to look for. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, um, Yi and Pramisha. Um, so now I'm going to invite um, Lucy uh, to come on and Anne. So uh, Lucy is the Policy and Camp Campaigns Manager at the NCD Alliance and a member of the Workstream 2 on Food Demand. And Anne is from the Sun Business Network Coordinator for Senegal and a member of the work Workstream 2 uh, on Food Demand. So over to you, you've got two minutes each. And so um, I'll give you a 10 second warning, um, but uh, two minutes each uh, to respond to this idea. Super, thank you. Great to be with you all today. Um, so I have to say procurement doesn't really sound exciting, but it actually has really exciting potential as a double duty action for malnutrition in all its forms, including diet related non communicable diseases and hunger and undernutrition. And it definitely can have win win potential for both people and planet. But there are three things we feel that should be considered to improve this idea. First, how can procurement truly optimise and support local and shift incentives toward improving the profile of all foods available and in demand in communities? Local and healthy foods can also be really expensive and, and this can prevent very difficult choices for purchases. So how can fiscal barriers, for example, around trade and taxes and subsidies be adjusted to ensure that the healthy, local and more sustainable foods are more financially viable? Second, how can procurement standards leverage other related measures? So could standards be based on and trigger improvements to for ex um, improved sustainable and healthy diet guidelines that are tailored to local foods and knowledge and needs? And how can they also leverage food profiling such as that used for food labeling where healthy, um, least, uh, the least healthy, safe and nourishing foods are excluded from eligibility and public facilities are supported to use labeling to make procurement 
procurement choices. Standards for procurement which leverage these actions could actually shift entire portfolios, drive down costs and shift community preferences and behaviour. Third, how can we design this solution to overcome corrupt systems? Procurement can be notorious for exploiting smaller producers, providing substandard products and services throughout the food system uh, and benefiting those with misaligned interests. What monitoring and enf enforcement mechanisms will be needed to ensure the best use of public resources and optimal outcomes for people and planet? And, community, and can communities themselves be part of this accountability mechanism? Well done. Thank you, Lucy. Um, two minutes to you, Anne. Thank you, Paul. So my first remark is about the financial capacity of the public sector to subsidize meals in low-income countries for the institutions mentioned. So if I take the example of school canteens, the fact is that in many West and Central African countries, school meals are mostly subsidized by donors with a low capacity of governments to guarantee support to those school meals and then make these programs sustainable. So this low financial capacity may explain why public sector financing of meals could be a real challenge in low income countries. So the relevance of this solution depends a lot on the local context. Then I come to my second point. Um, in terms of encouraging people to make better choices, I would suggest that the communication strategy goes beyond that, which means that it is crucial to make healthy food aspirational more than a rational choice, which means making people want to eat that healthier food, for instance, by a new way to cook. Uh, because in some contexts, one may have the choice to eat healthy food, but prefer to eat unhealthy food, depending on the local definition of unhealthy food, by the way. And this can be explained by personal or societal habits. So FBCC will really have to focus on these points. And finally, if I had to add something else, um, it would be the training, the importance of training and awareness of those who are responsible for public procurement, because um, I consider that they are key actors in changing the diet and they are a critical link between producers and consumers. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Um, so I think we now need to give uh, Yi and Pramisha uh, a chance to respond. I'm going to give you uh, five minutes to respond together. Um, while you're responding, I just want to encourage the audience, please put your questions into the, uh, the Q&A box. Um, and we'll, if we've got time, we'll either answer them on here. But it's really important that we have that engagement in these ideas. The ideas need to be pushed like Anne and Lucy have. And this is the process to really shape this um, going forward. So over to you. Um, for a response. Five minutes. Lucia, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you, Jen, and thank you, Paul, Lucia, and Annie for these really important and difficult questions. And yeah, I'm going to respond to one question of Annie that how can we make these um, a healthy food aspirational and not only, not only showing its nutritious value, but actually aspirational and attractive to young people, children, and other people also. I think uh, the main uh, target for this could be the communication channel and influencers, especially in developing countries. Uh, we have seen the previous examples of how to harness the potential of influencers, media influencers in those countries and using making the local communication materials and using those in the communities. I think that could be one of the best solutions, especially in case of developing countries. And regarding the question of how to make the local um, local food um, cheaper, especially in the institutional settings uh, in regards to the question of Lucy. I think uh, uh, it needs the collaboration between the government, NGOs and INGOs, because the institutions like mm -hmm. World Food Program and FAO can collaborate with the government and with the collaboration, they could subsidize, uh, they could pay the farmers and subsidize those meals. Uh, over to you, Jian. Yeah, thank you, Pramisha. Yeah, thank you for, the, for these questions. Uh, very um, different really layers of uh, considerations that we need to take into account. Um, 
about the question on uh, leveraging other measures, we definitely think that's uh, a very important uh, aspect of this solution that uh, the improving our procurement policy can actually leverage uh, other uh, measures in the uh, improving the food environment in on campus. Uh, we can definitely uh, use this to leverage, uh, for example, uh, production of healthier and more sustainable uh, uh, food uh, in local agriculture, as well as um, implementing uh, uh, food education for in some uh, instances, as well as also uh, as part of as a uh, supplement to this, we can also encourage uh, gardening also on, on school campuses, uh, which will also have received uh, solutions on that uh, as a supplement to, to that. So, um, and also to, to the question of the corrupt system. Uh, yes, they were, you know, we've seen that uh, in other uh, social sectors as well, but we also see that in other social, other social sectors, uh, transparency also helps to, uh, and also participation of the civil society and also um, some monitoring system that is stored can help to, uh, to make uh, these solutions possible uh, in other social sectors as well. Um, in, in the, on the question about communication for uh, more aspirational food, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's like the one, you know, we see a, a lot of overlapping areas between Workstream 1 and Workstream 2. Uh, it's like the two sides of one coin, uh, you know, it's how, how can we uh, increase the aspiration for, for better food uh, among the consumers while, uh, in, you know, improving the uh, food environments because, you know, not all, uh, not every decision that we made about uh, choosing which food to eat is rational or is based on uh, uh, some uh, out, like uh, uh, good thinking, you know. So there are a good behavioral uh, sciences that uh, give us inspirations of how we can uh, Im improve uh, people's choice of a food uh, by creating an environment where they can uh, where they can eat more healthily and sustainably, and also training of, of uh, ten of seconds. You yeah, Ten more we actually have received also uh, solutions on that as well. So uh, one of the uh, aspect of the uh, looking for this uh, solution is that we can actually combine uh, solutions ideas that are we received and uh, grow them into a bigger idea. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So good to see the um, interaction, the pushback and uh, the conversation. Uh, we've got some questions. And so um, I see the chat going constantly, which is awesome. I see lots of people sharing, which is great. So we've got uh, the first question um, I'm going to go with is from Anonymous. And uh, so um, Anonymous says, please share your views on how we could better incentivize people. And then in brackets, it says, and reduce lobbyists' influence over government to transition into whole food plant-based diet in order to reduce our carbon footprint on the planet while preser preserving our health, restoring wildlife and feeding the entire humanity? So it's a big question. Um, who wants to take a shot at that question? Uh, maybe we've got time for two short answers or responses. Who wants to go? You? Pramika? Sorry, you, yes. yeah, could you repeat that question? I didn't hear the question. Oh, sorry. Pramisha, did you get it? Uh, can you please repeat the question once again, Paul? Sure. So um, please share your views on how we could better incentivize people and reduce lobbyist influence over government to transition into a whole food plant-based diet in order to reduce our carbon footprint on the planet while preserving our health, restoring wildlife and feeding the entire humanity. Yeah, this is a very important point. Uh, I actually, uh, uh, the, the, the second you know, largest set of uh, solutions that we received actually are related to uh, how we can reduce uh, consumption of animal foods. Uh, based on our uh, experience here in, in China, uh, there are also, you know, many different, uh, we need to build a, a mechanism that uh, to help the government to uh, align these goals uh, with 
their priorities. For example, uh, the China Chinese government has uh, the new commitment to for uh, for going carbon neutral, as well as uh, food safety. Uh, food security has become a very important uh, priority for the government. So on one hand, we need to align this uh, with government uh, priorities. On the other hand. Uh, increasing uh, increasing uh, choices for plant-based food, as we have already seen in the past few years, uh, has been su successfully attract more people for, for that kind of uh, choices. So Pramisha, do you have any? I'd like to add something uh, over here. I think we need to increase the conversation between the government and the private sectors and the corporations who are uh, producing the like of uh, food with more carbon footprint and highly ultra processed food because if we could get the conversation going and if they could like devise the legal procedures i think corporations can actually um, lead up to the transition to, uh, transi transit their business into sustainable business i think so uh, we need to keep the conversation moving between government consumers and the private sector that is also uh, one of the ideas Sorry, I muted myself. You always do that as a, a moderator at once, and then you never you you never do it again. Hopefully, um, so uh, any any response from Lucy or Anne? We've probably got time for one of you just to maybe add a comment, or if you want to. If not, I'll move to the next question. No. Nope. Okay, we'll go to the next question. So the next question is from Ben uh, uh, Ben Volk from Rabobank. He, he said, "School meals are great." because of the control you have over nutrition and diversity of foods, but they have to be paid for. And usually in low, to, low income countries, it's governments with very tight budgets and shifting political priorities. So how do we ensure consistent budget for school meals? Anyone wanna jump? I see, I see uh, you nodding, Lucy, did you wanna, or? It's funny, my final point that I didn't quite get to was that we need to make this sexy and sell it to the right people. And I think that um, one of the challenges is we're sort of operating in silos still, even though we're trying to break them down. And, and certainly there's a, there's a need to jazz up these sorts of pictures around procurement, for example, and and speak better and pitch better to those who are pulling the purse strings. So we need, you know, there's no economic language in this conversation today. Where is that? We need that, and we need to be able to speak to the finance, the finance managers, and we need to be able to to understand where those those barriers are. Like I mentioned, in terms of trade and and tax and law yeah. and so on and tariffs, we need to think about these things so that we're we're incentivizing. You know, someone's also commented around indigenous procurement. Like this is really really very important. So <clears throat> definitely need to be speaking to outside of the, the existing silos. No, I appreciate that. Um, and from uh, uh, the business network coordination in Senegal, do you have anything to add on that? Yes, quickly. That's an interesting question. Um, what I would say here is that um, the, the, the local community uh, is really important in that, in that process of making uh, school feeding sustainable. It's not mm -hmm. about only the, the government responsibility. Here in Senegal, uh, the local community ha is really involved in supporting school feeding because it's about their children first of all. So it's it's a it's a multi-sectoral approach, I would say. So this is important to involve everyone in the in the school feeding value chain. Let's say that. Thank you. Yeah, I've got I've got time. This is really critical, and I think we're starting to get the, the the pull of the tensions here. And I think I like the idea of involvement of the community, making it sexy. There's another question that's just come in, and I'll, I'm going to squeeze it in. Um, Ashley uh, McDonald asked. Um, she said, I would worry about food safety, which if compromised could hurt this idea that this solution is healthier than other options. How do you continue a high level of food safety that you see in this solution? Um, so I'll give it to um, Pramisha or, or Yi. Do you want to uh, jump in? Pramisha. Yeah, yes, Your Honor Paul. Uh, as Anna said already, uh, the, there is the power of local communities because their children is going to have the food in the schools and in the institutional settings anywhere. And if we could 
get the produce produced by the local farmers and those local communities that uh, that could be sustainable. And they won't want their children to eat the food that is produced by a lot of chemical pesticides and fertilizers. So in these settings, I think uh, communicating with the local people and collaborating with them would be great because uh, the uh, local communities want their children to be fed healthy meals and they would produce their produce sustainably. So also the government incentives and subsidies also come in this way to make it more uh, like uh, cheaper and also uh, to, uh, to ensure that the organic food they produce is um, like they can get uh, quite returns from it also. Thank you, uh, Pramisha. Um, so we're going to be we're going to be moving to the next work stream, um, but uh, I'll, I'll give you the final word. Just if you want to uh, respond um, to any of those comments in just maybe thirty seconds. Yeah, this is uh, the food safety issue is exactly where we have to come in to reform our procurement uh, policy. Because a few hours ago, we were actually convening the chi first China dialogue on this, and we actually have someone presenting this as a China, China example. Uh, the problem is now is that, they're, they're, for example, for meat, uh, the standard policy is that you have to buy from the uh, factory farms. Uh, and very often, uh, these are very cheap meat that has a very, uh, and also shipped from long distance that actually potentially has a very big uh, potential uh, food safety issues. So if you change this policy to procure more locally uh, with higher animal welfare and a shorter distance, actually that will improve the, uh, the safety of this food. So that's exactly where we should come in to, to improve our policy on procurement. Perfect. Thank you, um, Yi, Pramisha, Lucy, and really appreciate uh, the work that you guys are doing on these um, solutions, the challenges there. Um, it's good to see um, the conversation happening in the chat. There's 27 questions have been answered already, either online or in the conversation, and it's and it's good to see people in green. So um, I'm going to let you guys jump jump off screen and get into that conversation chat and start uh, responding to people. And we're going to move to work stream two. And so I'm going to invite uh, Luke and Daniel uh, to come and they're going to present a solution. So um, Luke is a, a recent graduate from the University of Adelaide. Go Australia. Um, so it's good to see another Australian on um, with a passion for food systems. And he's a youth member of work stream two on food demand. And then Daniel is the director and founder of the Better Buying Lab and Cool Food, and if you don't know what Cool Food is, you should check it out, um, at the World Resources Institute. And he's the lead for Workstream 2 on food demand. So I'm gonna go over to you guys. Uh, you, go, you have four minutes to present this solution. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Pleasure to see you all. Um, Paul did a great uh, introduction to us there, so I'll save you repeating our work. Um, just to say that we're um, very happy to be having this conversation and look forward both to your feedback on this idea and also the submission of many other ideas. So um, without further ado, I will hand over to Luke, who will talk you through our idea, one of our ideas. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Paul. I'm just going to share my screen now. Bear with me for one moment, please. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Cool. Well, yeah, first of all, thanks so much, everybody, for joining. It's really exciting to see the engagement, especially so many people asking some really interesting questions. As Daniel and Paul mentioned, I'll be discussing the Workstream 2, which is in relation to food demand. And the solution I'm excited to be discussing tonight is incorporating environmental sustainability into national dietary guidelines. But first, what are dietary guidelines? So dietary guidelines are government advice on healthy diets specific to the country that they are uh, designed for. So for example, here we've got uh, two common layers of dietary guidelines in a food pyramid and a food plate, which you might've seen for your own country. And dietary guidelines ideally form the foundation for government nutrition advice and educational campaigns, as well as other food policies with the goal of helping people uh, access and eat healthy diets. So they're really the foundation for healthy and sustainable food systems. However, some countries don't actually have dietary guidelines at all yet. So the first step for them, which is really key, would be to uh, create some dietary guidelines. 
Another challenge is that most dietary guidelines do not actually consider environmental sustainability and are therefore mostly and often not sustainable. So in fact, last year, an international team and I published a paper in the British Medical Journal where we evaluated both the healthiness and the environmental sustainability of all national dietary guidelines, which turned out being 85 countries. So what do we find? Unfortunately, two thirds of guidelines were actually incompatible with the emissions budget for food, which I saw Fabrice actually describing earlier in the chat. So I have a little bit of a scroll back if you wanna know what that means. Uh, but it's essentially the allocation of the Paris Climate Agreement that's allocated to food. Uh, so if your country is in red, you are actually one of the few that uh, had guidelines that were compatible with the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, additionally, many guidelines were actually not very close at all. So in the case of Australia, which is my country, in the, you, see, you can see in the circle in red, that our guidelines, if adopted, would actually exceed the carbon budget for food by more than a factor of four. So what can we do about this? The key solution we're promoting is for dietary guidelines to consider both health and the environment. And here you can see the guidelines of Indonesia and Sierra Leone, which were actually the two countries out of 85 whose guidelines met both health and environmental goals as stated by their own governments. Uh, and another key point is that we found that many of the changes that would be beneficial for environmental sustainability would also actually have additional health benefits. So here, these two goals aren't in conflict. They're actually uh, synergistic. And another key thing is that sustainability would be defined at the country level based on local context. For example, some countries might want to give extra weighting for climate considerations, whereas others might have water scarcity issues, so might want to give priority to water. Other considerations could be biodiversity, nitrogen and phosphorus use. However, luckily you don't just need to listen to us because others have also recommended this solution, uh, including the World Wildlife Fund, uh, the Lancet Medical Journal and the UN Committee on Nutrition. So if this is such a great idea, what are we waiting for? Well, fortunately, some countries have actually already done this. Uh, you can see them highlighted in green. And this uh, is a, a, about eight or 10 at the moment, but every year there's another couple joining the list. So uh, hopefully we'll see some more soon. So the solution here is really to increase adoption so that first, all countries have dietary guidelines. And second, they all consider sustainability in a way that works for the local context. Importantly, this is a solution where everybody, including everybody attending in particular, can play a really important role by encouraging your own government to include sustainability into your own dietary guidelines. Uh, thank you. And Daniel, I look forward to your questions and comments. Perfect. Well, thank you, Luke and Daniel. Um, it's it, it, it's, it's uh, now the chance for me to invite uh, Marie um, and Francesco to give a two minute uh, response uh, to your solution. So um, Marie is the um, official youth constituency of the UNFCCC um, and the focal point and member of the Summit Champions Network. And uh, Francesco is the director of the Department of Nutrition and Food Safety in the World Health Organization in Geneva. And the World Health Organization is the UN anchor agency for Action Track 2. So I'm going to give you uh, both two minutes. Um, Luke, if you can uh, maybe pull your screen down, that would be great. And um, then we'll, we'll hand over to you guys. I'll give you a 10 second warning when uh, you're coming close to your two minutes. So who's going to go first, uh, Marie or Francesca? Marie, of course. OK, Please, let Marie. me start. Thank you so much, uh, Luke and Daniel, for the presentation. Um, brilliant idea. And what I think is really um, well done that you first like did a quite extensive research, and it looks like, um, to base um, your recommendations also on, on very solid um, research. Um, my point, points would be, while I heard about the dietary guidelines, of course, in school, some like 10 years ago, I have never touched upon them again. 
and uh, you mentioned that Switzerland, I'm from Switzerland, is one of the countries who have sustainable dietary guidelines. I wouldn't per se no, and it wouldn't really change my habits. Um, and I also don't really see how it's, for example, changing um, institutional habits, for example, the university canteen um, or, or also school canteens, right? Um, so I think there we would, or like you would need to think, okay, how can we make them kind of having then an influence where you want to see the influence, right? I think this is the first one. The second one is if you have dietary guidelines, which maybe don't match what you can actually shop in the shops, um, it's nice to have these guidelines. But if there is still like, for example, the very cheap um, meat coming from, from, from oversea um, is cheaper than the fruits and the local um, veggies, it's very hard, again, as we heard in the previous presentation, for people to judge, right? And it's like a luxury thing that you can eat sustainable. And this, of course, shouldn't um, be the case. So again, like it would go as, as a recommendation. The first one, it needs to go hand in hand with um, subsidies or reshifting of incentives, especially for, for people who cannot afford um, this. And then I think the third one is really also about like this attractiveness, this about like being sexy, because the guidelines per se are not too attractive. So how can we bring across the message from these guidelines um, that people understand it um, in a way? Because very often the cooking is also a kind of a tradition, right? Um, so people, people um, hand over the recipes um, and this is like the way how they are cooking. And um, I mean, you mentioned you're localizing it, but it should be then like also like really brought to the family tradition, right? So I think this is an additional point we have to, um, Think about. Over to you, Francesco. Thank you, thank you, Marie and, and Paul. And uh, look, this is great, and uh, we're really happy that this is coming as a as a solution. In food-based dietary guidelines, we've been working on them for for many years. Of course, uh, uh, they translate uh, the guidance or uh, from nutrients into food, uh, and uh, we can also somehow shape. Uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, diet uh, with the food-based dietary guidelines. Uh, but they're not only a message for people, for consumers, uh, they're a tool uh, to develop uh, policies uh, to uh, inform a, a range of, uh, of national nutrition and health policies and programs. The fact of the matter is that true. I mean, not all countries have it. Um, you know, we don't know exactly the number because, you know, depends on what, how you define the document, but, you know, between 90, 120 perhaps country uh, uh, use the, the, the guidelines. Uh, 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 but uh, the point is, it's not sufficient to have the guidelines, they have to be used. They have to be used for the different purposes. And, you know, in our analysis, for example, only 12% of the country use them for, uh, for food procurement programs. Uh, uh, and that's, that's not enough. Uh, and then, you know, they don't include sustainability. Absolutely. Uh, it, that would be the, the game changer. Uh, of course, the dietary guidelines have to be connected with those policies. I mean, the, the Swiss have done this very nice uh, work uh, uh, to analyze uh, what it means uh, to uh, um, connect uh, with, the, with the policies, what are the, what, what are the gaps uh, there. Uh, so, if we could do this, uh, this would have a major impact, uh, not only on people's health, but also on the system and, and, and on the economies. Uh, we calculated probably uh, 10 to 25 percent of national gross domestic product uh, could, uh, could, uh, could be increased as a result of the application of healthy and sustainable food-based dietary guidelines. So uh, absolutely, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, something that we, we, we fully send. Seconds. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Francesco and Marie. Um, absolutely great to see uh, the response. We've got a, a range of questions coming in, but before that, I'm going to give Luke and Daniel. Um, I'm going to cut you slightly down. I want you to do it slightly shorter. Your your response because the questions are are coming thick and fast, and I want to give us time to respond and engage on the questions as well. So, can I give you three minutes to uh, do a response? Luke, would you like to jump first? Sure. Thank you, Mary Claire and Francesco. I think they're all really great points. Uh, and exactly the sort of thinking we need. So as I mentioned earlier, the dietary guidelines are really the ideally the foundation for a range of other policies which can really help people to eat more in line with them. So for example, one might be front of pack labeling for both health and environmental sustainability. 
uh, Mary Claire mentioned uh, the financial aspect. So one might be, for example, providing financial support so that people can actually afford to eat according to the dietary guidelines and eating healthy food is more uh, cheaper than it currently is. And in that case, the guidelines would be used to define what is actually healthy and meet that uh, and to relate that to the realities of the country which they're being crafted for. Uh, another was, for example, what about if that food actually isn't available in the supermarket? So that's where the dietary guidelines could be used to subsidize the production of foods that uh, the country needs more of to eat in line with the dietary guidelines. For example, many countries don't actually have enough fruit and vegetables for everybody to eat according to dietary guidelines. So that would be a really important first target. And Francesco, I would really agree with what you said essentially, that they are the tool for policies. And I guess the ideal end scenario would be, first of all, everybody has heard of the guidelines, but even if they haven't, then the food system is really oriented towards making sure that everybody has the means to eat according to the guidelines and making it as easy and attractive as possible. So yeah, thanks for those comments and I'll pass over to Daniel. Great, thank you, Luke. And I, th I think you covered off many of my thoughts there. I just echo that if we think about this as a document um, that just is complete and written and put in a drawer, I think that's where the idea of guidelines fails. You know, I, I, I'm really reflecting on your point, Francesco, that only 12% of them are uh, public procurement align with national dietary guidelines. So, you know, that's one critical metric that we need to make sure that as these are developed, they're executed. I think just the last thing I'd say, just to open to questions is for me, as we think about this, it's not only the output, but the process of dietary guideline creation as well. We need to make sure that dietary guidelines are done in a way that's participatory for different actors and different elements of industry within a country. But at the other hand, we need to make sure that that participation is balanced. Um, there's a couple of war stories I've heard um, of sometimes different elements of industry, for example, skewing different guidelines in different ways to maybe meet certain um, sector desires and demands. So we should think about not only how we maximize the output, but how do we also maximize the quality of the process as well? Thank you. And spot on three minutes. So well done, Daniel and Luke. Um, so we're gonna jump into these questions. It's great to see there's 45 questions already answered. We've got a number still being answered. Um, so the first question we're gonna jump into is from Jane Sherman. Um, and Jane Sherman says, food -based, RE food-based dietary guidelines. Really interesting to hear about the compatibility with the Paris Agreement on climate change. However, this only really matters if the countries effectively implement their guidelines. It seems that the evidence for this is very patchy. Who would like to comment on that? Daniel? Yeah, I'm happy to go and then might be a handover to uh, Francesco in particular. So, so my sense, if we're going to really make this work, is that we both kind of set a standard or an ambition for these um, guidelines to be there, for them to be developed to a high standard in the right way. But that should be coupled with an expectation of what good looks like in terms of execution. So they're there, but what are the five or 10 ways that we would, we would really um, aspire to see them being brought to life? And for me, that's a critical other component of this. So it's not just we, we, the game-changing solution is we end up with you know, 200 great documents, is that the 200 great documents results in 20,000 great actions. Francesco? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, the, the, the somehow the food-based dietary guidelines are, are the charter, the charter of the food system where everybody agrees on what needs to be done. But then, you know, the different actors have to take those actions. And, you know, it, it, it's about information to consumers. It's about uh, um, investments in, in agriculture. It's about public food purchases. Uh, and that kind of alignment is actually missing. So the food-based dietary guidelines are only considered somehow uh, a tool to inform consumers and 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 uh, not necessarily align with the other measures and that's a problem so the, the food-based data guidelines should be there should of course be 
uh, sensible and uh, aiming at healthy diet and, and sustainable food system, but then all the range of policy around it uh, needs to be to be considered, and and that unfortunately is is not happening. So so that's why I mean the idea that uh, Luke and Daniel are proposing is good. So let's start from both those food based dietary guidelines, and it, as I said. 120 countries maximum have uh, some kind of guidelines, but you know we have 194 countries, so there's uh, you know at least uh, a third which is missing. Yeah. So this is absolutely urgent, and uh, no. you know that's with also with the, with the other groups that are working this. I think the FAO is doing a fantastic work in in trying to also build the capacities, you know, to do this. Yeah. No, thank you. Okay, the next question is from Florence. Um, it says, it's a great presentation, Luke. What about social justice? You get the health and environment dimension, but I do not see the people who are engaged in the food system and are often very vulnerable. And then in brackets, it says, see action track four. So I'm wondering whether Luke and then maybe uh, Marie, you want to jump in on this one as well? Yeah, thank you for asking that question and relaying it. That's a really great point. And uh, I think it is uh, important to recognize that sustainability does incorporate more than the environment. Here we've focused on environmental sustainability as a first step, but ideally we would expand that to look at, for example, social outcomes. Uh, you could also eventually imagine, for example, considering we're, we're in COVID, for example, you might consider a uh, contribution to antimicrobial resistance or uh, one day even something like animal welfare. So I think that having a really holistic interpretation of sustainability is really important and something to work towards. And I guess we see this as a first step and something that is uh, really ready to uh, happen right now. Whereas we definitely need some more work looking at what a uh, socially just set of guidelines would actually constitute. So yeah, thanks for the question. And I'll pass to anybody else. Marie, do you want to jump in on that? Very just very quickly to compliment. I mean, it's all about the implementation, right? As so for so many things. At the end, if you have a Paris Agreement and no one cares about it, well, then it's also not ch like just in, in a social way, right? So if if we are managing to implement these national um, dietary guidelines in a way and that comes with the incentives, with the subsidy shift, with support for 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 the poorer community, right? Um, or if, even with like free food for 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 underprivileged uh, communities, then we have a huge benefit on the environmental, but also on the on the on the social level. But for this, we need way more commitment from the governments than only changing a document and then be like, well, now I did my job, right? Um, but then yeah. really go on and also talk to these people, listen to these people, and I think this is like where the hard path comes with the implementation. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've got. A a little bit of time and one more question. So I'm gonna see if we can uh, get this in. So um, the, the the third question is from, from Malte and I'm, apologies if I pronounced that wrong. Um, and it says for guidelines, the German Society for Nutrition compared their guidelines with the planetary health diet and showed that it fits very well. How did you compare the guidelines and come to a different result? So I, I'm, I'm wondering who is best to um, give that response. Daniel, do you want to jump in? I, I assume that that uh, question relates to the analysis that Luke showed from the uh, yes. uh, British Medical Journal. So, Luke, I don't know if you um, can can talk to that uh, German example in particular, or I see. sure. Yeah. So, what I, I I can't remember the details of the German example off the top of my head, but just very briefly, without going technical essentially what we did was look at the guidelines if they had a quantitative recommendation then put that into a model which, which is essentially just a way to quantify the health and environmental outcomes and if they weren't quantitative so it might have said for example eat more of fruits or eat less of sugar uh, in a way that a number wasn't given then we had to convert that into a number which um, was a little bit of a process so if you're interested, I will post the link in the chat, uh, but I'll save everybody the technical details, which might be, uh, I guess, a little bit less interesting for this purpose. Francesco, I'll, I'll, Allow I'll me give just you a... 30 seconds. I mean, I think the pain point, let's talk about the elephant here. The pain point of dietary guidelines in, is how we treat meat. 
and and we have you know many different ways to recommend meat. Of course, meat is a component of uh, all dietary guidelines, but some you know consider give give recommendation to reduce, some do not. And I think that's what, what we we definitely need also to discuss with with a scientific uh, uh, eye, but also with uh, with the eye of potential alternatives and and com and, and complements uh, in terms of animal uh, source food. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have to wrap. I'm going to give a uh, final, final comment. Um, Marie, I'm going to give you the final comment. Well, I think it's an absolute great start. And I think it's very important that I see already that young people are driving this agenda because I think this is so important because if you have been like cooking in a certain way for your entire life, it's very hard to change. But if we can change the habits of young people, and if we understand also the issues coming with it and what we can gain out of it, this is an absolute great driver for making these changes happen. So thank you so much for your research. And I really hope that um, yeah, one day or rather sooner than later, we have this in reality. Well, well thank you, Daniel and Luke. You've certainly um, stimulated a discussion. There's lots of questions there. Thank you for sharing the research and being really transparent with um, the way that you're thinking this through. And so please now go and jump into that chat and respond to people as able um, and uh, really appreciate that. So we're now going to move to work stream three. It's great to see the questions are still coming. Um, there's still conversations there. Remember that there is opportunity for you to still um, submit game changes to the 9th of February and you're able to then also join the, the UN Food System Summit community and get in there and engage with the solutions that are there to be able to share ideas. It's, it's like the chat, you can kind of see that conversation going. So please do that. So we're going to work stream three and it's, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Liz and Roman. Um, Liz is the senior fellow and director and the food, uh, food loss and waste champion of UN SDG 12.3. And she's the deputy lead for uh, Workstream 3 on food waste. And uh, Roman is the founder of Climate Proof Food and a youth member of Workstream 3. So I'm going to go uh, to you guys. Uh, we're going to give you four minutes uh, to uh, share your solution with us. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And um, hello, everybody. And um, great to see so many people um, virtually uh, engaged in this process. I want to talk a bit about food loss and waste, um, just to pick up two real, really important points. Um, currently, there really are not enough governments who have food loss and waste high enough up their agenda. They don't see the climate change benefits of tackling food loss and waste. And so it's just one of the other things that they must get around to at some point. And also food loss and waste is a complex issue. It requires collaboration. You can't just leave it to one person or one organization to sort out. It needs a mixture of public sector, private sector, and all of us as citizens. So our game-changing solution that we're, we're, we're giving some thought to is something we're calling 50 by 50 by 30 or 50 to 50 or something. Um, so this is about trying to get a commitment of around 50 countries to actually say, okay, so this is important and we're going to actually focus on it. We're gonna set targets to halve food waste by 2030. And we're gonna set up public private partnerships involving the public sector, the private sector. And it will mean that we then have a proper national strategy. We measure across the country, we understand where our problems are and we work together with the, with the private sector to come up with solutions. And the reason I think this would work is because everyone has a shared goal, you get more transparency, you get collaboration, you get flexibility and approaches. And I saw in the chat, there'd been a comment about COVID and no consideration of COVID. I think the trust that's built up through a public private partnership allows you to actually adapt to, to crises like COVID when they happen. So I, I can see real benefits in this. There are already a number of countries who are doing public private partnerships and, and have shown that they do work. They can be adapted and they can be flexible for different types of environments. So developed countries and developing countries, you don't have to have, it's not a one size fits all. It's about having this shared goal. Um, so that's that's our, our game changer. And um, I, I, I discussed it with Roman and uh, I think you'd think it's quite an interesting idea as well. Absolutely, thank you, Liz, for the introduction and thanks to all the speakers beforehand. Um, I think this is a really exciting idea and think that it has so much potential to address such a huge issue that we're facing. 
obviously food waste and loss is a really complex issue that also represents more than just loss of food, but loss of resources and a large contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there's, as Liz mentioned, so many different benefits to this as it involves the public and private sector. Um, it encourages our governments to launch consumer campaigns to reduce our food waste at home, which for in, depending on where we are in the world, the, in, the food waste in the retail and in our households might represent a greater portion of the food waste, or it might be for earlier along the supply chain and be more about loss. And I think this solution um, can change depending on the country to create more relevant and appropriate solutions based on what, what is um, a greater issue. Um, Liz, I wanted to ask what, what you think some of the barriers might be stopping governments from sort of launching something like this already. So I think, as I said, I don't think that they really see the benefits of tackling food loss and waste. Um, and also they have, you know, that frankly, they've got an awful lot of other things on their, on their agenda. Um, I mean, in the last year, you have to say that COVID has absorbed pretty much all the bandwidth of, of every government around the world. Um, so actually, they don't have the, they don't, they haven't been able to prioritise it because they don't see the benefits. So I think one of the challenges is that the Food System Summit provides an opportunity to make that case and really demonstrate that actually we're not going to achieve any of the, uh, the Paris um, commitments if we don't tackle food loss and waste. And we're not going to have a sustainable food system if we don't tackle food loss and waste. Excellent. And right. I think what is... Oh, sorry. Oh, 10 seconds oh. to get over on um, this whole <laughs> This summit we can all agree on is giving food a lot more of the respect it deserves. And hopefully we can see this happen in the food waste and loss sector. Um, thank you. Thanks, Liz. Sorry for jumping in, uh, Roman. We're going to keep moving. Um, I thought there was a natural break, but I, I, I didn't realise there was another addition there. No so problem. thank you, guys. Thank you. And I, I, I really appreciated that presentation. So we're going to invite um, Lasse and Emil, Emmeline, sorry, um, to come in. So Lasse is the Executive Director of 50 uh, by 40 and the Civil Network Lead of Action Track 2. And Emmeline is the Director of Food Reform for the Sustain and Sustainability and Health for Fresh, a project of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and a member of Workstream One on Food Environment. So you're each going to get two minutes. I'll give you a 10 second warning, um, but uh, who wants to go first? I'm happy to go, Emmeline. Emmeline. Okay, perfect. Two minutes. Great, thank you. A great idea. I love uh, tackling food waste. It's so important. I have three concrete points I want to make. One is about fairness of approach. I mean, post-harvest in low-income countries needs a bit more focus here, I think, as opposed to post-consumer uh, waste in high-income countries. And also, it's about being more fair and ethical about what are the most pressing issues for feeding people. I know you thought about this, but I think it needs to be a bit more prevalent. Number two, stakeholder engagement. I think subnational engagement has to be very high on the agenda to ensure that national plans are coordinated and aligned with uh, procurement plans, for example, at the municipality level, which speaks to the issue of that was made before about uh, the national di dietary guidelines. And also you need to ensure local and national farmers are including in these partnerships from the onset and that will entail working with unions such as the ILO, the IUF, and of course, La Via Campesina. Point number three, a few missing elements, I think, that needs to be considered. The next nine years leading up to 2030, which is what this project is looking to, is likely to see much more erratic weather patterns and failed harvest and post-harvest loss due to climate change. So that needs to be built into that project as well for, for uh, to be, make sure that is uh, ready for the future. Another aspect is that uh, I think it's worth mentioning that industrialized animal agriculture is also a true type of uh, food waste. Uh, converting crops to meat leaves most of the food energy as emissions and manure instead of feeding people directly, and that has to be considered. And finally, um, pandemics. While the aftermath of uh, COVID-19 and the connection between livestock production and pandemics have illustrated that a uh, less reliance on animal agriculture actually creates more resilience for food production. So part of addressing food waste should therefore avoid a food production that creates volatility. So shifting towards more plant-rich food production is, is quite likely to be uh, preventatively mitigate food waste as well. Great, thank you. Love it, over to you. 
Perfect. Shall I go? Thank you. Over to you, Emily. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. So, absolutely, really like. First of all, I have to recognize that food loss and waste is it itself a subject that is game changing uh, because, as you said, it touches upon all of the. Uh, sustainable development goals. Um, you've highlighted the environmental impact and the environmental uh, potential, but you know equally, of course, reducing hunger and also poverty. Because as Lasse started to say, you know, a big part of the issue is actually really at the post-harvest level, especially in developing countries. And so, in the proposal, it's recognised that a lot of countries have made actually great progress. For instance, the UK, but equally, there has been really difficulties um, at the production level. And so one of the suggestions would be also to highlight how does it differ from existing efforts? Um, I see one difference, which is you propose a national level approach, which is really a good idea. It helps governments really identify the hotspots and the communities they want to focus on. One way that would be really interesting is actually when choosing the communities is to understand which are the ones which have the most environmental and the most health um, interest, by the way. Um, but then we, uh, we need to also really link it to measurements. So how do we measure the progress? And I think you've proposed that, but we see it as a, as a, big, um, um, a big challenge here. We know that uh, especially the farmers and the producing uh, companies have a hard time, uh, first of all, establishing the baseline and then measuring progress. So that could be a, an easy factor, an easy action, which is to develop a simple methodology that helps them. And certainly the knowledge, uh, the awareness is one of the, the big challenges. So that's what you're proposing to address and that would be good. How do we learn from uh, what has been already uh, happening? And how do we learn from the success factors, but also what has not worked would be one area. Um, and finally, I also would like to propose that we maybe try to change angle. We often focus too much on how do we reduce things. And the question would be, how can we highlight the potential, the benefits? What is there in there for the farmer for the companies, for the consumers to really change their patterns. And maybe you will get also a different type of momentum. So again, really like this idea and happy to uh, see how we can develop it further. Perfect, thank you. There's a, a, a really good productive uh, list of, of points to address. So I'm gonna give it over to you guys. Um, I'm gonna give you four minutes. So if you're gonna split it two minutes each, um, but let's uh, see if you can respond to uh, the, the, the points uh, raised from um, your colleagues. Go. Great, thank, thank you. Maybe I'll kick off and then hand over to Roman. Brilliant cat. <laughs> um, so I, I guess that you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are some great ideas which we, we need to build into this, into this concept. Um, where to focus, I think that's the beauty, beauty of the having a target measure act approach is because if you start to measure, you see where the problems are and you can then focus. So the UK, yeah, you're right, 70% is in the household. So the, the focus needs to be right up at the household end. Um, in countries where the issues are all around production and on-farm losses and stuff actually getting from the farm to the, to the manufacturer or to the market in the first place, then you have to focus there and maybe the, maybe there the the emphasis is actually on building that coalition among um, farmers and among uh, distribution organizations and among manufacturers to actually get them to focus on their on those problems um second point about stakeholder engagement agree absolutely and and you can see where some of these public private partnerships have worked they're, they're starting to they've been making their way down the supply chain so they start they start maybe in one place but gradually they then end up working with their suppliers and their, and their suppliers and you get back to the farm so we've got to make this feel like an inclusive process so that everyone benefits and that's way how you will get a supply chain solution not a solution that works for the retailer or a solution that works for uh, the manufacturer it will actually be a supply chain solution that that benefits for everybody um, I completely agree, we need to build in something about climate ad adaptation and pandemics. Um, and on the measurement piece, I mean, there is, there's going to be a food waste index coming out from UN Environment uh, shortly. There's also the food loss index, and we need to maybe make try to find ways of making that those easier and simple for people to use so that we do actually have ways of helping people to measure in a very simple way. Roman, I don't, you've got any? Um, so many really interesting points and very all very important. Um, 
more or less agreeing with a lot of the comments that have been brought up. Um, I think, yeah, the fairness of post harvest uh, would like to, you know, in an ideal world, see the exporting of infrastructure and resources to support, um, you know, farmers and producers in developing countries with, for whatever reason that those post harvest losses are happening, whether it be storage or if it's logistic issues, which might have been exacerbated by, you know, COVID and border closures, which has happened here in Australia, we've seen a lot of on farm losses increase based on lack of labour being able to get out to the farms. Um, I also like the comment about how we might need to consider some forms of industrial agriculture as, you know, a bit of a waste as it represents quite an inefficient form of you know, production. And that is something that then maybe could filter back into the previous conversation about sustainable diets. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, that's for me at the moment. Thanks, Liz, for covering, covering that. Um, yes. Any more questions? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we've got, we've got a number of good questions coming in. So um, really appreciate the people that are, are, are sticking with us, putting the questions in there. Um, thank you to the team that's answering them as well online. Um, and we'll, we'll try and get through a few more here. So, um, so the first question I'm going to go to is uh, from Anonymous. Um, Anonymous uh, said, uh, Roman, um, great question to Liz uh, Goodwin. Ari, what are the barriers for people in government positions to support food waste policy and initiatives? We all need to be straight up about the barriers. Take away the barriers and we have progress. So it's, it's, it's a comment more, but does anyone want to comment on, on that? I'll just make one more comment. I mean, I think there is another barrier, which is um, about funding, um, because there's because of this lack of awareness, there's nobody wants to fund anything on food. Um, they, they're very keen to fund things on deforestation, on oceans, on plastics. Nobody actually wants to fund anything on food. And so you don't get the funding going into um, awareness raising campaigns or into helping train farmers or into um, providing cold storage solutions or to um, educating consumers. So I think funding's an issue. Yeah. Uh, Roman, do you want to respond as well? Um, as far as barriers for people in government, I think seeing some of the creation of, you know, en you know, entities devoted to reducing food waste and loss might be a pathway to, you know, re reducing that more so than creating a group that is responsible and can support the pushing of those campaigns and frameworks and initiatives might be a way to make it a lot easier for these sort of things to happen in, in various countries. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've got the next one is from Alwyn um, and it's it's directed towards you, Lasse. Um, it says grassroots community led groups are increasing, especially in cities, rescuing food waste and redistributing it to meet social needs and address local food injustice and food insecurity. How could this focus on public private partnerships include these citizen led responses to food waste? No, I think that's a really good point. And I think um, generally we're going to be seeing much more urban food production, also urban food waste being in, um, uh, connected. Um, when we're engaging with people who produce and, and produce food and procure food locally, we open up a whole new territory for collaboration, which is so important uh, for this. I think in the coming years, we need to see uh, a much stronger focus on uh, looking at food waste from the life cycle perspective. And this is also addressing some of the other questions I've seen coming up. But yes, there is some elements and some situations where food waste can be directed to livestock. But let's be honest, 77% of global um, agricultural land is used for livestock production, either for grazing or for feed. So one of the biggest issues we can uh, address is to tackle the industrialized animal agriculture. Yeah. Emmeline, do you want to jump in on that, on the, the public-private partnership opportunities? Sure. Well, I, I think it's been stated by Liz um, and Roman, you know, is that um, we like the approach of um, setting up national goals, but thereafter, indeed, a lot of the work lies in the hands of the producers uh, and the companies. 
And so uh, there is all of this question of, first of all, developing trust and collaboration. And we can, we can build on a lot of the existing private uh, uh, pu public partnerships that have existed already. Um, and then there is really a question, I, I agree, to the resources. You know? And it's often a question of uh, where do you find the, the investments and what's the return on investment uh, in those terms? And I think one of the other game-changing initiatives that we're thinking of uh, across the different action tracks is something that we call um, the true value of food which is how can we really associate, it's not about increasing the price, it's about what's the value of the food and how can we really try and stimulate funding towards reflecting a food that is produced in a better way, uh, that is not wasted and that contributes to more healthy diets. And that's a whole subject in itself, but I think that's a critical component of changing the rules of the game. Thank you. Okay, let's jump to the next question there. Um, this is from uh, Malt. Uh, the most important point for avoiding food waste is harmonized measurement across countries. Um, momentary, we are, discuss we are discussing on a database of one year, and it says 2011. Is there a plan to measure trends? Otherwise, we cannot measure the success. I might go to you, Liz, on this one first. Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point. Um, and because we haven't had the metrics and the measurement approaches, it's been hard. Um, we do have the food loss and waste um, protocol, which was developed, um, which I, I know a number of companies and countries are using. Um, but as I say, um, UN Environment is about to publish, I think later in February, um, a food waste index, which will, which is a, a, an approach that any country in the world should be able to use to actually measure food waste within its own environments based on what what data it would already has um, and then alongside the food loss index that should allow every country to have a picture of what it's of, of how it's doing and to therefore monitor progress so I think that will be a big step forward. Thanks Liz. Um, we've got another question here um, this was uh, a question that came from Anonymous and it said possibly a silly question but if we reduce waste in countries that have a net calorie surplus, don't we risk increasing rates of overweight and obesity? If more food is being eaten, surely that's a risk. Who would like to take that one? Emily? Uh, <laughs> oh, Liz? Who? <laughs> no, let Emily go with her, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, it comes across a bit as a silly question. Maybe there is, there is a, something that I'm missing, but I think, uh, you know, if you save the the amount of, of uh, food that you've produced, it doesn't mean that somebody is going to eat that. It means you will really, actually change the amount that you're producing in the first place and or that you will help also redistribute, by the way, because it, let's remember that um, people are not accessing food the same way. And indeed, there is overconsumption in some of some of the world, some of the places and some of the um, the different groups of the population. But there is also really lack of access to food in other places. So it's it's a wider question. I don't know, Lisa, how you would have answered that. Very, very similar. I think, you know, it doesn't naturally result in more being eaten. Um, it, yeah. it means you've got more, more crop to sell into another market. Yeah. OK, I've got another one here. The, these questions we've had, we've got a, we've saved a, a small bit of time. We've got probably time for one one more. Um, this is from uh, Nat. Uh, we often talk about how to reduce food waste, but not much about how we prevent food waste in the first place. Prevention will address the roots of the problem. Otherwise, food waste will be a forever problem. As you said, collaboration is key. How can all stakeholders along the food value chain from farm to fork collaborate to prevent food waste? Thanks and greetings from the University of Oslo. So this, this is a quite a big question. Um, I think we maybe can have a couple of people comment. Who would like to go first? I'll happy to give a quick comment. Yes. Uh, it's, it's a very excellent point. And I also alluded to, the, to, me, to it in, in the feedback I provided. Um, at any given time, the US, for instance, has four times the amount of food produced than what pet people actually eat four times. And that's because if there's a system based on having surplus of food, food big sur surplus food uh, storage. And I think that is something that also came out of uh, World War II, that there was a necessity to prevent 
uh, future uh, food nutrition deficiency. Uh, maybe that whole system, that mindset needs to be changed. We don't need all that surplus storage anymore that leads to food waste. Mm. Interesting. Liz? I, I think it's, it, it, I mean, to get the whole supply chain, you need to have far more data and tr transparency of data. There's, a, there's an awful lot of, of evidence of companies keeping data rather close to their chest and not wanting to share and not wanting to admit what their what their wastage levels are, what they're doing, how they approach things. If we had more transparency and visibility and sharing of risks up and down the supply chain, so rather than a contractual arrangement that results in the farmer bearing all the risk, um, that would really help. And I say, I think it's, it's addressing some of those uh, sort of inequalities up and down the supply chain. Maybe if I, if I can get, give a concrete example, um, we've actually worked on mapping the supply chain and where the food loss and waste uh, hotspots were with one of our retailer members. And what was really interesting, and I think that's what you're proposing to do in your, in your proposal, um, Liz and Roman, you know, is to identify those hotspots. And I think indeed there is a big part that, that is actually preventing it. So in the example we took, we're looking at uh, fruit and vegetable in a retail shop. A big part was about the uh, requirements that the retailer was putting, for instance, on the size of the apples or the color of the apples or whatever. And there was a lot that could be done there and fully agree that it should be the starting point. But thereafter, there was also a lot of different hotspots. And one of them was whenever the fruit or vegetable was getting to look less nice, then people wouldn't buy it. And this yeah. is where you need the collaboration across the, the, food, um, the food value chain indeed, because there is a way to actually use these and send them to the different manufacturers, use the bananas that don't look so good, and actually really put them back into the production of other products. But that requires collaboration again. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're, we're about to wrap. I'm going to give Roman you one last word to uh, respond. Sure. Um, I think that one last word. Oh, um, no, you can say more a few words. It's okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, just on the last one, I think there's definitely a lot of different ways in what Lasse was saying about resilience and having different forms of diversified systems to both improve resilience to climate and, you know, pandemics as well as, you know, you've got urban and local food systems, which although might not play the major role, can also play a big, a big step in support, improving resilience in communities, providing access to nutritious food and also providing social value as well. Um, yeah. And as well, uh, implementing a whole of chain approach so that all the different stakeholders are communicating up and down to reduce losses at each step of the way is a big part, um, as well as addressing the, what Lassie was saying, the inherent sort of oversupply as well and might need to, need to change. Yeah, Thank you. Oh, no, absolutely. Well, well, you guys have definitely um, sparked discussion and debate. I know um, there's... It's, it's really good to see how the solutions coming together and it's, and it's good to see the back and forth. And I think the considerations here. So thank you. Um, there, there's a number of questions there. We're gonna be wrapping up um, just now. So um, I'll ask if you guys can uh, turn your, your screens off and I'm gonna just, uh, just so people are aware, the, um, the questions are all, all, all being answered. Um, the, the next uh, forum, I'm going to invite um, uh, the chair, Gunhild uh, Stordalen of Action Track 2 to come and just give the final closing. But before I hand over to her, I'm just going to let you know that this, uh, these conversations, these public forums, the next one's going to be in early March. But between now and then, we really want you to not just kind of forget about this process. Get involved. Give us your ideas. Put them into the survey. Go to the community use the hashtag online, share the ideas. You, all the organizations involved and represented here today, they're all working in on this. And so you can reach out to them, share, have a follow-up conversation. This, this summit is about really listening and engaging with everyone. And so I just want to encourage you to all do that. So over to uh, Gunhild, the founder and executive chair of EAT and the chair of Action Track uh, 2. Thank you, Gunhild. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, thanks to all of you that have been joining and uh, participated in this amazingly lively uh, debate. Uh, I think we have something like 126 questions in the Q&A function and many, many more in the chat. And uh, I'm sure that our three work streams now have a lot of important inputs to 
bring into their work going forward. And to me, this meeting just reinforces that we can't do this without you guys. Because after all, this is a people summit and we want to make sure that our work is tested and debated and adjusted as we go uh, to really make sure that the menu of solutions we present in the end, the integrated menu together with the other action tracks is truly game changing. Mm. So as uh, Paul also said, it's not too late to contribute with new ideas. Uh, our online forum is open for uh, yet another week until February the 9th. And the link uh, is here in the chat. And also our next public forum will take place in early March, uh, where we look forward to present a, a more comprehensive list of solutions areas or solutions propositions for your feedback and uh, really for you to scrutinize. Be because after all, this is a global dugnad uh, for fixing food and dugnad, of course, being a Norwegian phrase that I've been uh, pointing to before, uh, which means that we come together in times of need uh, and everybody brings their ideas, their talents, tools or whatever they can contribute and we do something uh, for the greater good like we are just now for the first UN Food Systems Summit. And also as we move towards the summit in uh, September or October, uh, we will continue to work now in parallel uh, closely with governments, with farmers, food producers and the food industry, civil society, as well as citizens and voters to actually come behind these game-changing solutions and commit to take action because at the end of the day, the success of this summit will be all about whether we succeed in turning great solutions on paper into game-changing action on the ground and really move the word, world uh, towards a healthy, sustainable and just good future for everybody everywhere. So, okay, folks, this was all for today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and looking forward to seeing you next time. So thanks again for being here and helping us. Have a nice one.